Hello, everyone. We are back with technology and my friend Keith Tier, the editor of That Was the Week, the tech newsletter where he aggregates all the content. Last week, we talked about uh, whether or not we asked whether Silicon Valley has an AI bubble problem. That was the title of Keith's uh, newsletter from last week. Is there an AI bubble? I answered, duh, which of course is a yes. I think there is a massive bubble. Uh, and this week, though, Keith, you have uh, the rise of the algorithms. So what is it? An AI bubble or the rise of the algorithms? They're not really in contradiction, although I'd love to get inside your head and understand how you thought they were. <laughs> Um, I mean, well, there's an AI bubble, and then we have the rise of the algorithms. It's got to be one or the other, because AI is algorithms. So either the algorithms are rising, it's a genuine rise, or there's a bubble, or maybe well, both. I mean, I know you're looking at this from an investment point of view too. Remember, remember that you said there's an AI bubble, but I said my answer. You was thought there was, there could be one, which means that for a, an optimist like you, there probably will be one. Well, actually, I said yes and no. And on the yes side, I said, there is one, but it's a good thing. And the rise of the algorithms is a good thing as well. Well, the, the rise of the algorithms is all about um, the main news story this week, actually, which is that BlackRock, which is the largest investment company in the world, has spent $3 billion plus buying a company called Prequin. Prequin is a company formed in London quite a number of years ago, 20 or 30 years ago that is one of the companies in the space of data for uh, private company investing, a little bit like Crunchbase. And um, $3 billion is a, a big price tag. And the CEO of BlackRock announcing why they're, they're buying Prequin said that they believe that there's going to be a trend towards, in quotes, indexing private markets. And, of course, that made my ears prick up because... Um, my company, Signal Rank, indexes private markets, specifically Series B round venture backed companies. So, um, so I, I decided that you know, if BlackRock, which by the way, uh, in its previous history bought Barclays Global Capital, which owned the iShares brand of uh, public market funds, which are also indexes. Um, BlackRock is the world's leading indexing company. Um, if, if they believe it's true, then all those people who've been saying to me for the last couple of years, Keith, what you're doing doesn't make sense, now I have to eat humble pie. So that, that's, that's, so the, that's the private market indexes are coming, although your, your, your logic is based on one acquisition, right? No, more than that. Um, it's also based on the thing we've discussed on previous shows, which is uh, Destiny's Tech 100 index, having listed on the New York Stock Exchange and doing very well, uh, trading at four times the underlying asset value, which indicates that investors like private company indexes. Uh, that was the second thing. So, so when uh, explain because not everyone is as sophisticated as you, Keith. What is a private market index? What does that mean? Um, yeah, it's a good question, Andrew, because there's a lot of subtlety here. The first thing is to acknowledge that private markets typically are not indexed. What does that mean? It means that private markets are where venture capital and private equity plays. And typically you have firms picking single companies to back. And an index is the opposite of that. An index is when you buy all the companies in a space um, to create, to, to, if you will, capture the average performance of the entire asset class. So, um, you know, the S&P 500 would be the one most people would be familiar with. It's 500 companies. When you buy the S&P 500 index, you get a little piece of each of those 500 companies weighted by the companies. Um, and, and in private markets, that hasn't existed. Uh, the reason it hasn't existed is nobody can invest in every venture-backed company in an asset class. For example, every seed company or every A-round company or every B-round company. So up until now, indexing has not really been possible. With the rise of algorithms, it's now possible at least to claim 
that you can pick a subset of the companies that will outperform the average and that that subset takes on the form of an index. You invest in every company in the subset picked by the algorithm. So there's a great article this week by Jared from, from Rebel Fund. He picks Y Combinator companies. And uh, he shows the stats to show that the algorithms he uses to do that outperform the average Y Combinator company. Uh, now, he is not indexing in the sense that he's not going to list publicly and let you and me buy shares. But he kind of is indexing when it comes to using algorithms to s select a subset that will outperform the average. Uh, okay, so I get your point. But coming back to the bubble issue, the rise of the algorithms you're describing in this week's uh, newsletter, the private market indexes, is just, uh, in a sense, is the froth on the AI bubble. It, it, it's not proof that the there is or there is or there isn't an AI bubble. Is that fair? Yeah, it doesn't really address that narrative at all, um, because I will argue that... Um, BlackRock's three billion. It, it, it's buying a company with revenue, and Prequin is not an AI company, but BlackRock is an AI company, and it will plan to use that data to enhance its AI selection process and build indexes from it. So it's so it's fairly complex. I don't think it directly addresses the bubble question, but that's a big check. So um, you could say that tangentially, at least, it does. Signal rank, by contrast, we find it super hard to raise money because the world doesn't yet understand how powerful indexing is, or how powerful the algorithms are. So we struggle. I think we're going to struggle less in the aftermath of the last few weeks. But it's certainly early uh, in the adoption curve of this idea of private market indexes driven by AI. And therefore, no bubble there, at least not yet. Well, let's go back to the bubble issue. Um... A lot of the articles this week that you link to, to me at least, and maybe I'm a natural pessimist, but to me at least prove or, or certainly con convince me more and more that we are living in an AI bubble. You you quote O. Malik. He's one of your favorite writers. He, um, he talks about the future appropriate enough of writing, how AI will shape or reshape our tools, and he's touting a product called pseudowrite.com and I tried it out and it was so bad that it was almost absurd now yeah, maybe my my reaction is anecdotal but how many of these companies Keith are, are just raising money because they claim to be AI companies so in 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 the writing space it's companies like pseudo right maybe they're better than my experience was but I tried them out and 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 they just it just seemed to be so bad, so much worse than what I myself could write. Yeah. So I'd separate a few things out. I mean, firstly, Ohm. I don't think Ohm is especially touting those two apps. Lex as well is one he mentioned. I think he's just using examples. And more important in what he said is is this concept of building AI tools into writing tools. He, he wrote the piece because uh, you'll remember WordPress. I certainly do. Um, the founder of WordPress passed away last week. Yeah. That triggered him to write the piece. Um, I agree with you that the tools he mentions are not very good. I use, do you use Grammarly? I use Grammarly. No. Well, so Grammarly is a, you know, it's a word and sentence checker, uh, a meaning checker. It's got a thesaurus. Uh, it's very good. Uh, it's nowhere near as good as OpenAI or Claude. And if I copy and paste stuff into OpenAI or Claude, it, it will do a better job than Grammarly. Now, OpenAI and Claude are not yet built into any word, presser, uh, word processor. If they were, I think I'd be interested to see what would happen. I, I think something good would happen. As long as you were writing and it was helping and you weren't kind of trying to... Um, um, delegate your writing to an AI because I don't think the AIs are good enough yet to do writing better than humans. I mean, they're so far away. One of the other articles you linked to this week is another one about boom times or the bubble uh, from Spyglass, lowering the boom on the new boom times, and it talks about how much money 
is flowing. How, how much of the current stock market boom, Keith, is being driven by uh, AI optimism? Well, I think uh, the, the NASDAQ is being driven a lot by NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google uh, in particular. And it's more than a lot. What, what, what numbers are we talking about? I mean, if you took NVIDIA, Google and Microsoft out of the NASDAQ or indeed the broader economy, um, you would have you wouldn't have a crash, but you would certainly have a severe recession. Well, you, would, you wouldn't have a, a rising index. You know, the NASDAQ composite is an index. And it, seven companies drive, drive most. So you'd have a, a sharp correction on Wall Street. Well, you, you actually have had one. It's just disguised by those companies having gone in the opposite direction. Most companies have lost value in the last couple of years. So the same with the S&P 500. Uh, Apple is a huge part of that, for example. So um, I do think the index is, and that's, by the way, the beauty of an index. Uh, lots of companies, companies can be losing, but the index still gains if, if, if it's led by um, winners. So... I, you know, it seems to me that... Yeah, but your obsession with indexing is just a reflection of signal rank. What about for the rest of us? I think my particular obsession may well be, but the general obsession with indexing is driven by the fact that it works. Um, yeah, but it doesn't work. Indexing didn't work when during the Wall Street crash. I mean, the, the, the economy has to be underpinned by something real, with or without indexing, with or without algorithms, Alg algorithmic indexing. So I'll explain. This has to be real. And well, at the moment, it does just strikes me as being increasingly fictional. Well, I, I think that's because you don't pay attention. I mean, um, if you look at the GDP growth in the US, it's, it's very healthy. Um, so there is something real underneath. Well, that's it. a fair point. I, I accept that. But but coming back to and, but how much of the GDP growth in the US is being driven by AI. Well, do you think Tesla is AI? Well, Tesla's a strange company. Well, it's a part of the GDP. It's the biggest car sells in the world, and it's American. Um, so so I, I do think that the answer is yes. AI, AI is on the production lines. AI is in uh, customer outreach, um, reducing costs. Uh, I think AI is... Very early, by the way. I mean, one would want to overstate the impact yet. I think the future impact is a lot bigger than the current. But, but yeah, AI is there. And you, you also have to not don't separate the idea of an index from a company. An index is made up of companies, and companies have to have profits. And if they don't have profits and aren't growing, their stock price won't go up. And so the index won't go up either. So there is a you can trace a line from an index to, you know, lithium being mined. Um, it, it is real underneath. And, and there's no way an index can outperform real. I agree with you on that. You're entirely right. But the world, the world economy only really grows when two things happen. One is productivity goes up. And two, uh, consumption um, mm. doesn't fall. And it seems to me right now con productivity is going up and consumption is not falling at least in the States. There are some parts of the world where it is. Um, I think there are some dangers. The biggest danger isn't AI. The biggest danger is aging and whether uh, the, the declining working population can be, can be compensated for by automation, which I, I think it... Yeah, and you had one interesting piece um, uh, in this week's newsletter from the CTO of OpenAI acknowledging that creative jobs can be harmed by AI. Although, again, given how bad a product like PseudoWright is, I'm not actually sure that's true. Yeah, I wouldn't judge AI by PseudoWright. I, I, I would probably judge it. Look, I don't want to be old. I know a lot about AI, and I know enough to know that it isn't finished yet, and that sometimes it's disappointing. But it's not just, let's leave the, the we, we pummeled, or I pummeled PseudoWright probably unfairly, but there are lots of other companies. You 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 have a link this week, uh, Keith, to an end gadget piece about now you can get AI Judy Garland or James Dean to read you the news through Eleven Labs, which actually isn't a bad product, much better than pseudo, right? 
But I'm wondering, is there really a business model that people really going to pay to get AI Judy Garland or James Dean or whoever to read you the news? It just seems it's like we're back in the 90s and there are all these people desperate for a business model using technology to chase it. I must admit, I smiled at that one. It, it made me think that... I mean, you listed these. I, it's not like I'm making this stuff up. These are part of the newsletter this week. Yeah, yeah. That's, I put it in because it made me smile. It made me think that the product manager at Eleven Labs, which, by the way, is a great company technology-wise... Aren't you... Uh, aren't you uh, you've invested in them at... Um... No, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, uh, they, they, they would have qualified for the Single Rack Index, but we didn't invest because we didn't get access to it. Um, but I was going to say, he must, or she, must be my age. Because why would you choose Julie Garden? I mean, even older than me, actually. Why Julie would you, Garland, not Julie Garden, Keith. Why would you choose Julie Garland and uh, James Dean, which most young people who might want to have a book read to them have never heard of? Would it? I think it should be P. Diddy and, you know, Tracy Ullman. It is, whether it's P. Diddy or Tracy Almond or... Judy Garland or James Dean or Marlon Brando, is there really a market for these sorts of things? People are going to pay for this? I mean, it's all fun. And it was always fun in the 90s. We both did startups back then. Yeah, All sorts of creative ideas were thrown out. Very few of them actually made money. There wasn't really much of a business model for most of them. Yeah, I think 11, I use 11 Labs. I've done my own voice on You it. pay for 11 Labs. No, and I've used it. So I could give it this week's editorial. And it will give me back the spoken version in my own voice. Um, you know, how good is it? It's really good. It, it, it can do a Yorkshire. Oh, I could do a. I could do a, a, a. That was the week with an eleven labs Keith here. Yeah, if you get, if you copy and paste text, it will, and I, and I give you access to my voice because it's I own my own voice. But if I give you access to my voice, yeah, you can uh, you could do a, read the you could make. You could write something and have me speak it. It's only audio, though, no video. So what we really get to, uh, we'll get to it later in the show, but it's starting to be the case that you can do the same with video and voices. And you've probably seen some of those. On right, the and then and again, and I keep on saying basically the same thing, but your startup of the week is a company called Runway, which... Um, apparently, according to uh, some online media, um, is in talks with General Atlantic for a $4 billion valuation fundraise. So having seen that, I went, I think I may have even emailed you the, the link in the first place. So I signed up for Runway. And again, it's, I mean, maybe not be quite as bad as pseudo, right? But it's not that impressive. What did you do with it? Just out of interest. I, I, I looked at their their front page video, which supposedly is their strength. I didn't use it at all. And it was just this music and lots of weird video that didn't strike me as being particularly original or worthy of payment. I asked it to make me um, a scene of people serenading on the Scarborough seafront. That's the town I was born in. And um, I didn't give it a picture of Scarborough and it produced its own video with some weird hybrid Scarborough. Yeah, and it's... Yeah. <laughs> but it was good enough that I recognized that it was Scarborough. And it wasn't that bad. I mean... Well, not that bad. And yet, uh, General Atlantic is invest uh, believes it's a $4 billion company. I actually... I did play around with it. Uh, on our street in San Francisco, it's a narrow street. A bus got stuck last weekend. So we took some photos. Uh, and I put the photo into Runway and said, make me a video showing what happened and explaining that it was the driver who screwed up because the bus took the wrong turn, shouldn't have been on our street in the first place. And the video was just a, an utter mess. It didn't understand what I was asking. And the yeah. the, the product was was worthless, Well, it, less than worthless. Well, so I, I think just one detail. Uh, um, the article I pointed to talks about a new version. I'm not... Sure, that new version is yet available on their website. And we've all heard of new. There's always a new version. The, you know, the, every, I'm sure uh, and the your company has a new version as well. We, uh, the demos in the piece accompanying the new version claim that it's better than Sora. Sora is already very good, although it only produces one-minute videos. I don't know how long these ones are. Sora is an open AI product, is it? Yeah. Uh, 
Yes. But if, if you ask the question, why would a sophisticated shop like General Atlantic, which is a super intelligent investor, why would they do this? Then you've got to, let, let's start by assuming that they're not stupid. So, which they may well be stupid, but I, I'm going to guess they're not. But they weren't any less stupid in the 90s when it wasn't, may not have been General Atlantic, but when lots of highly credible VCs poured ridiculous amounts of money into crappy startups. But they made a thousand times more money than they put in. Even the, even they did, but everybody else lost, really. Well, who's everybody else? There's only venture capitalists and startups. There's no one else. Well, if, if you want to go back to the 20s, if I mean, maybe this would or wouldn't create a stock market crisis. But if, as I suggested earlier, these large, the, the big tech companies like NVIDIA and Google and Microsoft are being radically overvalued because of this AI boom, ultimately, the correction won't just affect the startup. Um, environment, but everybody. No, I think that's too gloomy. I, 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 I mean, I'm prepared to be nuanced about what could happen, and I certainly think all bubbles end in crashes. So I don't disagree with you. But are you are you are you acknowledging now there's a bubble? I I've always said it's a bubble, but I think it's a good thing. I think bubbles are good. Bubbles indicate opportunity. If there's no bubble then there's no excitement. So was the tulip boom in, in uh, a bubble? Was that a good bubble? Or was the, the bubble in the 20s around the American automotive industry, was that a good bubble? I think the, the I don't know enough about the tulip one, but my instinct would be that was nuts. The a more automotive one and the railways ones, I think were not nuts, because why? Well, but, but, you know, in the, if you take the really long term, it's the Keynes argument or joke that in the long term, we're all dead anyway. But the automotive one, Keith, sure, in the long run, probably you've got the roads and the, the railways and the well, the rail. But leaving aside the railways, let's say the roads, uh, the, the, the automotive bubble in the in the 20s, which resulted in the great crash. Um, I'm not saying that the 2020s are the same, but there are some ominous, eerie similarities. So the car industry was good and ultimately car technology radically revolutionized everything about america I, I but we still had to go through the great depression yeah but i i don't think it's it's not intellectually honest to focus on a crash unless you draw the whole graph before and after and and, and if you if you look at the stock market over any period of time really it only goes up so yes there it goes up like this, and, and when it goes down, it's a crash. And w we recently have seen three of them, right? You and I lived through the internet bubble. We, we lived through 2008, and there's one happening now. So, uh, yes, there are crashes, but those crashes are crashes in the context of human progress. I, I mean, that, but that, that's a, a tautology. Uh, but coming back to... Um the current situation, it's not equivalent to the 20s because there's m many more protections against a stock market crash. But what's the worst that can happen, do you think, in the current environment? I mean, I know the Google numbers because uh, my wife works for them. I mean, their, their stock has gone up almost 200% in the last couple of years. And it's basically the same company. Well, no, the, reven the revenues have been going up as well. Um, uh, I don't know if the revenues have gone two hundred percent, and they shouldn't. Or well, Microsoft's the same. I mean, Microsoft's gone up even more sharply. Yeah, but if you if you do the math on the growth in revenue and profit, and you look at the multiplier effect, you know how how much does your stock gain for a certain amount of profit? I don't think it's it's uh, disconnected and got out of whack. So it's, what's the worst? Okay, I say okay. What, what's the worst that could happen? The if there is a really, really sharp correction later this year or next year in the stock market, in the public stock market. That you that some of the gains you've already made won't exist anymore. Well, that goes without saying. So you're, the worst that can happen is you're still gaining, but not as much. What happens if the stock market goes from, for, from the, the Dow goes from 40,000 to 20,000? which has happened in the past. 
I mean, you know, that, that means a million dollars becomes half a million, right? So it, 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 I don't think any of these things are life-threatening. I, th I think it's part of capitalism. I, I don't, I'm not really sure what you want in, you know, rather than this. But to me, it's, it's part of capitalism that you speculate to accumulate. I, I'm okay with that. I, I, there's many things about capitalism I don't like. But speculating to accumulate, I'm okay with. And venture capital is where the most extreme speculation happens because that's how it's designed. So let, let's go back to the algorithms and the AI revolution. There's clearly massive froth. What is real? Open AI is real. The, the, the Google and Microsoft applications are probably real. What else is real, Keith? Well, I think, the th I can tell you one thing that isn't real. It, it isn't real that lots of money is going into AI. Um, that's a myth. Lots of money is going into these companies you just described as real. But actually, small AI companies are finding it almost impossible to raise money. You mean the pseudo? Well, what about Runway? They just they, you, We just have the, that's why they're their startup, your startup of the week. They just got a, a, a $4 billion run, valuation. God knows what their revenue is. Well, remember the key word there is in talks with. Yeah, it, it hasn't happened. Yeah, but then why put it in the newsletter if it's not a real piece? I mean, what, what kind of revenue would a company like Runway have? No one's paying for this. Actually, the, the reason I put it in the um, newsletter is because of the quality of the videos it produced, not the valuation. But what kind of revenue do you think Runway would have? I mean, you're a, you're an experienced investor. What would be your guess? I would guess still quite low. Un certainly under 100 million a year. Probably, probably around 10 million a year. So for a company that 10 million, even entering talks with a VC for a, a four billion dollar valuation is slightly absurd, isn't it? I think that just means you don't know how venture capital works, Andrew. That, you, you probably could never be a venture capitalist because you could. No, I could. no one's going to trust me with their money. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust myself well, with my own money, let alone other people's money. But you, leaving that aside. But it, it's really about um, risk and reward. It's what bet are you prepared to place on the likelihood that this thing will become a thousand times more valuable than it is today? And, and General Atlantic have a lot of money, so they can take a big risk. That $4 billion valuation, probably they're putting in $100 million, And, you know, they manage several tens of billions. So it, it's a smallish bet for them. And if it turns out that uh, that $4 billion becomes worth $40 billion or even $400 billion, which is not too idealistic these days, then that will have proven to be a great bet. And Would that, you make that investment, though, in Runway? If I had General Atlantic's capital, I might. Uh, you know, it's it, the valuation is an irrelevant data point in an early stage company. The only real data point is what will be the future value, and how fast will it get there. So you don't really care about the short term valuation as long as you believe it's going to go up and go up fast. Now, let me revise the question. Coming back to these what I think at least very unimpressive AI companies like Pseudo Right, maybe Runway, maybe Eleven Labs. Is it conceivable that this whole AI economy won't take off? Is it conceivable that even the open AI CTO is wrong and that none of this is really going to make any difference? And in 20 years, you're still going to have writers and filmmakers and musicians basically using similar tools that they're using today. Yeah. I find that hard to believe just because I use the stuff every day and there's enough that is very valuable that I don't believe that can ever go away now. One, it's like once you've seen it, it can't go away. And, and a lot of money is flowing to those good things. Now, if you ask me another question, which is, is it going to be like the rest of venture capital in that 90% of these investments will fail? The answer is yes, absolutely. That's guaranteed. That's the whole point of indexing. 90% of these investments will fail, but the 10% that don't will carry the whole thing up so that the total amount of money made will be vastly bigger than the total amount of money. Is that made. true of our show too? 90% of what we say is a waste of time, but how are we going to know the 10%? That's not up to us to know, is it? That's for others to decide. Well, finally, Keith, you've done a good job defending <laughs> venture capitalism. Um, the uh, the X of the week, I think, touches on it as well. It's from uh, Cloudflare to 
help preserve a safe internet for content creators, we've just launched a brand new easy button to block all AI bots. It's available for all customers, including those on our free tier. And that's T-I-E-R rather than T-E-A-R. E Keith's tear. Read our blog post for more details. Does that show, Keith? I mean, maybe Cloudflare is doing all right. Does that show it's like back to the the, the gold rush of the of, of the 19th century? The, the only people really making money here are in 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 the 19th century, it was Levi's selling selling the uh, the miners their clothing and, and picks. These days it's companies like Cloudfare and probably NVIDIA. Yeah, I mean, Cl- Cloudflare is a great, a great example of some of the things we've been talking about. Cloudflare today is valued at thirty billion dollars. Thirty billion. Its annual revenue is one billion, one point three. So it's valued at thirty times its revenue. I, uh, Ma- Matthew Prince and um, Michelle Zeitlin who were the two founders. I was their mentor at Sequoia Capital when they did Tech Crunch Disrupt in, I'm going to guess it was 2012-ish, um, when, they, when, when they got their first investment and people said, how could you value that company? I hope you, did you invest? I, I did invest actually, yeah, I did. Um, they eventually IPO'd, now they're worth $30 billion. And um, what they do is they run your network uh, and, and they protect it from all kinds of bad stuff. So this is, um, and they weren't very well understood because in those days people didn't really understood how networks worked. So they were very technical and, and it was hard to get people to understand them. But now they're huge. Now, um, what they've done is they've added blocking bots from using your site for AI training. Um, and it's part of then services they offer if you if you use them. By the way, it's free for small companies. So like New York them. Times, I know they've got a lawsuit with uh, OpenAI claiming they're stealing their content. Uh, if New York Times used Cloudflare, Cloudflare software, then the OpenAI crawlers couldn't access their data. Is that right? Correct. As long as they respect it. I mean, uh, the, the I mean respect it. Well, well, it's a set of rules. They're standardized. Um, uh, technically speaking, you put a file on your server called robots.txt and you put rules in there. And everyone usually agrees to play by the rules, which is if it says, no, you, you Mr. OpenAI, cannot, you don't have permission, then the OpenAI crawler won't look. Um, that's the way it works. I don't know if that's exactly what Cloudflare have introduced. It sounds like they've so it's a real, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I've been rather negative today. The Cloudflare is a real product. It's not like Pseudorite or Runway or Eleven Labs. It's not speculative. There's a real demand for what they have. But again, it goes back to the success of a company like Levi's in the 19th century selling clothing to the miners. I think that's true. Uh, it's also true that OpenAI sells models to developers. And it, and it come, I mean, you've often pooed pooed this, but it seems as if the real interesting model for what's going on was the success of Cisco in the 90s, who, in a sense, I guess, it was a network company, much more powerful than Cloudflare, that was driving the 90s boom in the same way as NVIDIA now is driving the 2020s boom. Yeah. And when you look now, I don't know what. Uh, I don't know what uh, they're doing uh, Cisco, now. Cisco is worth 190 billion, so it's worth you know divide that. Not a lot. I mean, you, you, your startups worth more than that, isn't it, Keith? <laughs> I wish that would be nice. That would mean I'd. Build but at one point, Cisco was the most valuable company in the world in the 90s. And now it's tiny because Microsoft's worth trillions. You know, 190. Yeah, billion. And you think in. 20 years' time, uh, the fate of NVIDIA will be out of Cisco. There will be just another company. Well, what, what's happened, actually, Andrew, is the value of software has grown relative to the value of hardware. Cisco is a hardware company. And the cloud has virtualized hardware so that the biggest companies in the world now are software companies um, because most money is spent on software, not on hardware. You, 
you know, hardware has become commoditized and sold. Uh, you know, the service providers buy it and provide right. you with a cloud service. So I assume Cisco probably now is more and more of a software company too. A good example would be if I, if I yeah, it, it, well, not really. It's still that most of its revenue comes from hardware. But if, if, I, if I bought an NVIDIA GPU today for $30,000, which is roughly what they cost, if I can put it into a computer and run it, I can get that $30,000 back in three months. And the next, the rest of the year, I'm making a profit because the software running on it is more valuable than the hardware. You sound like an NVIDIA salesman, Keith. We, um, we are having a break for the next four weeks because as Keith and I need a break. It's summer. Um, it's summer, and summer is not a time to worry about technology. But to end, Keith, because we won't talk again until August, a couple of questions. It'll be a month's time. What's the chances in a month that the entire world economy will have crashed? Zero. No. Zero? Zero. What are the chances that England will win the Euros? Also zero. <laughs> And finally, what are the chances that Joe Biden will still be running for president? Sadly, quite high, at least 50 percent, probably higher. It should be zero. Well, those are a reflection of my concerns. What about for you? Any, any, any? I'm always asking you the questions. Any, any reverse questions? What, what should we be looking for in the next month? What's interesting? My question would be, will Manchester United buy anyone in this transfer window? And my response to that is nobody cares except Manchester United fans. <laughs> but I haven't got any real, um, you know, I, I'm pretty decent at medium term and long term. I suck at short term. Why well, isn't a month? That's long term. Isn't that a century, a month in Silicon Valley for most people? I think maybe I, not the summer because everyone goes on holiday in July. That's what I think. I think our summer break is going to map to a summer break in the news cycle. Well, that's how we'll start, Keith. In a month's time, we will address whether or not the global economy has crashed. It's not supposed to be a show about politics, but it will be interesting to see. My sense, by the way, is that Joe Biden won't be running this time next month. But we will see. Have a good break. Mm -hmm.